We've been teaching postgraduates since the mid 1980s. We have several postgraduate programs and a vibrant PhD program. And I am absolutely thrilled that I'm going to get to listen tonight uh, and find out about five other programs and networks around the world. Now, because I'm coming to you from Australia, we have a tradition here of recognizing the traditional owners on the land from which uh, uh, we're coming to you from. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people. Um, they're the traditional owners on the land uh, here in Canberra, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I'm also going to acknowledge the elders of the Yagara people. Uh, Dr. Jenny Metcalf is hosting this webinar from Brisbane, about 900 kilometers from where I am. Uh, and the traditional owners there are the Yagara people, and I'd like to acknowledge them as well. Now, this is especially important, I think, because the indigenous people of Australia are, I like to think of them as the first science communicators. About 75,000 years ago, they left the African continent, the southern tip of which Marina Joubert is currently sitting. And they made their way to Australia. They interacted with the natural world. They became expert shipbuilders. They were artists. They were astronomers. And so, of course, they communicated all these things. And so I'd like to think about them as the first science communicators. And we still have much to learn from our indigenous peoples. And of course, teaching and learning. That's our theme for this evening. And so we will get on to that momentarily. Housekeeping for our webinar tonight. Uh, I've just got three things. First, I think most people have already muted themselves and also um, have their cameras off. This will help to preserve bandwidth. So thank you very much for that. Uh, second, we're gonna handle questions in the chat. So we won't be stopping and asking people to raise their hands or anything like that, it takes too long. So we're gonna handle questions in the chat. So as you listen to each of the speakers tonight, please get in there and uh, make your comment, ask your question. Uh, and uh, Jenny Metcalf is going to keep track of those questions and we can ask them together at the end. So that'll be, uh, I think, the best way for us to have a virtual discussion. And third, another function I would like for you to learn is if you go to the participants button, you can see the participants listed down the side, and you can also see some small buttons there, yes, no, etc. Uh, I'd like you just to be aware of those because we might ask you some questions later on uh, toward the end of our meeting tonight. Um, and it's good that you know where those buttons are. So if we can acknowledge those three things, I think we are just about ready to kick off. Now we have one hour together uh, this evening and we have five sets of speakers for these flash talks. They will speak for approximately uh, five minutes. Uh, and then we'll go on to the next, next speaker and I will introduce them um, ahead of each one of their talks. So that'll give us a good, nice time to handle the questions and comments that are in the chat. So without further ado, we have our first fabulous speaker this evening, Dr. Melanie Smallman. Now, Melanie uh, is a lecturer in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at University College London. Uh, she's currently co-founding a new center. It's very exciting. Uh, for science communication. Now, you know, Melanie's been doing this a very long time. She uh, was uh, one of the first um, practitioners uh, of science communication in the UK with an established uh, Think Lab way back in 1999. Um, and she's been doing um, some amazing research in science communication ever since. Now, of course, in the early 2000s, she was also coordinator of the European Network of Science Communication Teachers, um, NSCOT for short, a a, a network dear to my heart in my early career. Uh, in the late 90s, uh, I was a member and uh, it was very important at that point as science communication was going global. And so tonight, Melanie's gonna tell us a little bit about that network. Go ahead, Melanie. Thanks, thank you for that. And hello everyone. I'm sorry we're not in the room together. Um, yeah, so we wanted to talk today a bit about um, science communication teaching and also the idea of maybe setting up a network um, of science communication teachers and when we had that conversation I remembered that well I didn't I hadn't forgotten but in the distant past um, back in about 2000 as Joan said um, she and I were both involved with the European Network of Science Communication Teachers and I thought it would be helpful to say a bit about that and I think kind of what worked well and what didn't so that we don't, um, well, so that we can learn from recent history. Um, 
uh, yeah and I think like Joan it was a pretty foundational experience for me um, in this field but I'll say a bit more about that so I'm not going to give too much detail of the project because we wrote it up in a paper in um, the Public Understanding of Science journal so I'll put a link in the chat when I finish speaking and if anyone can't open it because I'm not sure if it's open access then I'm happy to email that um, but the point, so the project, it ran from about 2000 uh, to 2003. My colleague Steve Miller was the director and set it up and it was funded under the Framework 5 programme um, for the European Commission. And that funding was really key to making this happen. Um, we had an initial core of five partners, well, sorry, multiple partners, but from five countries. So we had the UK, France, Germany, Ireland and Spain represented. Um, we set out to do four things, some of them more concrete than others. So first of all, we wanted to exchange ideas and good practice. So basically to network and share learning on that. Um, we also wanted to act as some kind of nucleus for science communication teachers throughout Europe. And I think the, the choice of Europe was specifically because it was European funding. And I think at that point, um, that's where things were developing the most rapidly in this area. Um, and then the two concrete deliverables that we had on our plate was we were, wanted to develop European modules on science communication. So we had this idea that there may be a European perspective on the relationship between science and society that we wanted to explore and develop into modules which we could then deliver um, in our respective universities. And lastly, we wanted um, to develop a series of science communication training workshops um, to support scientists working on framework programmes that they could come and do a residential workshop with us and learn sort of basic science communication skills. Um, and I think on the whole, we did all of those things. And I think that, as I said, they're clearly documented in the paper so I, I won't go into the details but I think you know reflecting on kind of what worked and what didn't and I think the modules were interesting and we did teach them in our own institutions but the, the key learning for me from that was um, well first of all without the funding the kind of momentum to use these things and to continue developing them just fell away um, but I think more importantly we were we were aware that the um, that local cultures mattered and that they would have to be adapted for each country but I think what became much more apparent when we started using them as well is that not only do we have national differences but even within that there's massive cultural differences depending on where your program sits so some of our uh, colleagues were delivering science communication training in an engineering department my own institution de delivers it within the context of science and technology studies others um, you know are in science communication units of their own so you know that wider context meant that these these modules weren't easily translatable but were never nevertheless useful and um, we also realized that delivering training to scientists is completely unsustainable without core funding so nobody's going to dip in their pockets um, out of a science project to do that um, and my own institution has come up with very clever ways of working around that, which I can tell people privately afterwards. Um, but I think lastly, the thing that was really key to the, the, the things that were really successful and looking back on this, I mean, it was almost 20 years ago, looking back on what's happened, was the, the sort of core network drew more people in and sent us out to other places. And people like Brian Trench, um, Rick Holliman at the Open University, they were the kind of, you know, Joan, myself, we've all come out of this and we made contact with Jenny Metcalf and Tos Gascoigne and that core of people who are now actually delivering training kind of got some coaching and mentoring in the process of being part of that project. And I think that for me, that would be the key thing to think about going forward. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you, Melanie. That was fantastic. We have fond, fond memories 
um, of that time. Uh, please keep the questions and comments uh, coming in the chat, uh, and we'll we'll come we'll circle back around that uh, at the end. Um, our second speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Franz Van Dam, uh, and he's going to be virtually joined uh, by Janneke Korn. Uh, Franz Van Dam teaches science communication at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. He's editor of the recent book Science Communication: An Introduction. Um, and together with Janneke, uh, he's made the first uh, inventory of the interests of science communication lecturers in a web-based network. So we're really excited to hear about that. So, Franz? Yes, yeah, and here, here I am. Good, uh, good afternoon and good morning and good evening to all of you. Uh, well, I'm going to start sharing my screen in just a second. And because I have a small presentation, which will only last for five minutes. I hope you can all see it now. Um, and of course, I realized that I'm here, I'm building or standing on the shoulder of uh, our predecessors, our people that are still around uh, in science communication, such as Melanie, uh, for instance. Perhaps a few words about the urgency of all of this, because I do think there is an urgency for more um, uh, communication among science, uh, science communication educators. And this urgency stems, of course, from uh, the crisis that we're facing right now. It's the corona crisis, the energy crisis. Uh, we're going to have to face a multi-drug multi resistant bacterial crisis, for instance, and that is the climate change uh, crisis. And these crises require that our science communicators, we uh, have new uh, skills, a new knowledge base. Uh, simply stated, I think we as science communication, science communication teachers need to teach our students new things. Um, and luckily, um, we do not need to start from scratch. Uh, we do not need to reinvent uh, the wheel and we can learn from each other. Um, personally, I do feel a need uh, to learn more things. Uh, it was only a couple of years ago, for instance, that I mainly taught uh, my students how to write, how to write an article, how to present in front of a layman's audience and how to uh, design an exhibit, for instance, for a science center. Um, and it uh, only um, uh, uh, since a couple of years, this has changed. It's now more about engaging stakeholders or engaging audiences, for instance. It's, uh, it's way more about evaluation of one's interventions. Uh, it's, of course, it's still about writing text, but it's also about how to use social media effectively, uh, for instance. Um, and I, I personally, I'd love, I'd love to work on bigger issues like how to intervent, uh, how to make interventions uh, uh, so that people comply better with social distance measures, for instance, or how to um, have effective communications uh, so that people uh, buy more consumer friendly, uh, for instance, uh, buy more uh, eco friendly uh, products, for instance. Um, so there is much to learn uh, for, from, from other science communicators. Uh, and that is why I plea uh, to, to have an online platform, um, um, perhaps a bit like Melanie Smelman's uh, platform of 20 years ago, a platform for science communication teachers. And recently my colleague, Janneke Korn, who is also participating in this session, and she might uh, contribute to this if I forget something or say something wrong. Uh, and, and me and myself, we carried out a survey among PST uh, list members asking them whether they would be uh, interested. Um, oops. And actually, uh, this, we, we, had, uh, we had about 66 respondents. I think there are, are about 2,000 members on this list. So we have way more non-respondents, I should say. 80% of these were uh, science communication uh, teachers, quite experienced uh, teachers. Uh, about two-thirds uh, of these people uh, were met already members of communities of practice. For their profession and half of these were already a member of a community of practice for science communication teaching and most of them mentioned uh, the PST mailing list or PST, the PST community in general. And we asked them of course would you be interested in becoming a member of such an international online community and almost everyone said yes and a few of them didn't know yet but not all of them were teachers of course. And what, so what content, and if so, what content would you like to see there? 
there's a whole list of things that people would like to see. Uh, merely mentioning the top three, they would like to see cases, uh, cases of science communication with from different regions in the world and from different disciplines. They would like to share curricula, um, and, but, and they would also like to share uh, uh, questions and dilemmas uh, that you can use for discussion in classroom, for instance. And I can later also share this PowerPoint so that you, you can have a look at the other stuff as well. I have 30 seconds left. Okay. I'll be, I'll be fast. Uh, we also talked about the functionalities for this platform. Uh, people were interested in a discussion uh, forum, in trainings and in uh, profile pages. Um, and people, uh, about half of them said that they would use this uh, as a resource uh, in, in their lessons. In conclusion, we think, or I think there is support for such an online community, for sharing knowledge, for discussion, and uh, for network, and of course, that is quite difficult because there is an, an, a list of requirements that one would need uh, in, in order to have such, a, such an online uh, forum. There needs to be a moderator, you have to have active members. At the start, there should be some, uh, some materials. There's a list of things you need to take into account. My question for you and for discussion is, do you also see the need for such an online community? And then who is interested in joining this initiative? And who wants to think along with me in order to realize this. That was it. Thank you so much, Franz, uh, and also uh, Janneke. Uh, so please, comments um, and questions for Franz and Janneke in the chat as we uh, go along uh, so that we can talk about uh, this, this urgent proposal that uh, Franz has uh, put in front of us. Um, so now we are on to our third speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stevenson. Uh, Elizabeth is a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, she designs and continues to deliver MSc uh, programs in science communication and public engagement, um, both on campus and online. Uh, so she's here to talk a little bit about the teaching context at the moment in the UK. So, Elizabeth. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, hopefully, if you bear with me. And start that up. Yes, so is that visible to everybody? Hopefully I can see it, hopefully everybody else can. Um, and I've started at the last slide, so excuse me a moment. Right, so following on from the previous talks, I felt it was important to understand that not all universities are created equally. And there's a particular business model that exists for masters teaching, for all teaching in the UK, and possibly a handful of other countries. And I think in the context of a teaching network, it's helpful to understand that context. So when I talk about a business model for a university, it doesn't mean a university is a business at all, but all universities need a lot of money to run. A large university like the University of Edinburgh, University of Manchester, perhaps costs about a billion pounds a year to run. And obviously the university has to generate that income. And a substantial proportion of that income in the UK comes from student fees for teaching. So 30, 40, 50% of the running costs of a university come from student fees. So what that's done is mean universities are actually competing with each other for students, even more so at master's level. And it is kind of understood that the teaching materials for top courses and programmes belong to the university, not to an individual. So although you didn't see some of the comments from the the survey, there were some comments about copyright, there were some comments about the amount of time it takes to develop a whole lecture course and would that be appropriate to share. And it's, it's particularly relevant in this business context that we have in the UK. Now it's even more focused, if you like, at master's level. So um, master's programmes in the UK, they're quite competitive with each other. They have to have, they have to be something identifiably different about them, but offer excellent learning experiences. And you have to keep developing your programme to be in that competitive market. 
So what that has really done in the UK is place a spotlight firmly on teaching quality. So this is why that business model is very much a driver for excellence. And universities do spend a considerable amount of time and employ academic developers to develop the quality of teaching. You cannot expect to keep generating income the way UK universities try to do with, without offering quality. Now you might say, are we all sitting in our university bubbles thinking we're offering quality teaching? Well, no, in the UK, we have an external examiner system that is mandatory in the UK. So that's somebody from a different university who's teaching at the same level or above in the same discipline that will particularly scrutinize your your assessments, they'll look for the quality of the assessment, they'll look for the consistency and fairness of the feedback, they'll look at the level the assessments are set. There's no point in thinking you're running a master's programme when the assessments are at first year university level. They'll also look at a course description, they'll look at the learning outcomes, and it's a really good indicator of quality with that external quality assurance stamp. And I was actually starting to think, could this be deployed in the network? Could we think about quality of science communication teaching and employ that same external examiner process in the network? I mean, there's other things that we can do. There are existing systems for quality and for sharing expertise, external advisor, guest lecture seminars, perhaps even more formal memoranda of understanding <coughs> and agreement, joint degrees, and not forgetting all the things that have appeared in the chat list. This idea of where is science communication now? Where is science communication going? What does it look like in different parts of the world? What does it look like when you're focusing on scientists, scientists from different disciplines? <coughs> Excuse me. So just to summarize, the network could embrace, uh, as long as as well as all the other things that the network could embrace, and I'm very much for this network, um, it could actually embrace this form of quality assurance as well. And, and just to say, do be mindful of the business model in UK universities and a handful of other universities, but I'm not going to speak for other countries. Hey, thank you. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. That's great. That's really provocative. There's a lot of issues there. I'm looking forward to uh, discussing in uh, the question time. So please, um, questions for Elizabeth uh, in the chat as we blister along uh, to um, our fourth speaker, uh, well known probably to many of you, uh, Dr. Luisa Maserani. Uh, she's a Brazilian science communicator um, and researcher and lecturer. She carries out practical activities and research. Um, she's the coordinator of uh, the Latin American arm of SciDevNet, um, and she's also um, coordinator uh, for the Masters of Science Communication at the House of Oswaldo Cruz, um, among many, many other things that she does. Um, she's won many awards, um, and tonight she's going to tell us a little bit about networks she has known. So, uh, Luisa, do you want to kick off? Yeah. Thank you so much. Good, mo good morning, everybody. It's very, it's not very early, but it's early. We are starting the day here in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And what I would like to share with you in this uh, short five minutes is uh, some results of a study that we conducted in 2016 in the scope of REDPOP. REDPOP is the science communication network for uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean. And what we aim it in this study was to, to know uh, more about the postgraduate courses available in Latin America. So we took in account program lasting more than 120 hours and that, that were held uh, regularly, uh, such as diploma, masters, and doctorate uh, in science communication. So we found 22 programs and we know that since then at the, there were created at least three other programs, one in Argentina, one in Mexico, and actually we created one in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I see that Carla Almeida is here in the group uh, who is attending this uh, web seminar. Carla was uh, with me in the group that created this uh, master in Rio de Janeiro. And we see that actually there is a very wide range of proposals and approaches. 
the program have different characteristics in terms of content, structure, approaches, objectives, length, but uh, uh, we can say that there are basically two types of course courses, uh, those solely based on skills development and those, those combining theory and practice. Uh, all the courses uh, that we identified actually are cl uh, classroom attendance. Uh, there is not an online course, which is really a pity. So in, th in times of COVID, for example, we had to, to uh, uh, redesign ourselves to, to uh, keep going. And uh, so 12 of uh, the programs explicitly stated that their programs aims to train professionals in science communication. Meanwhile, eight responded that their goal is to train researchers in science communication. And uh, 20 of the 22 course uh, said that they address a very mixed audience, which includes uh, museum curators, communicators, journalists, scientists, educators, uh, sociologists, designers, uh, cultural producers, and science teachers. One course uh, is targeted to journalists and another course is targeted to scientists. Uh, they are located in five countries, in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Mexico, in uh, 30 cities. And it's important to highlight that in Latin America, we have 33 countries in and I, I don't know the, how many cities we have. 65% uh, of the courses were in fact created over the, the past uh, 10 years, so they, they are very young. So we see that uh, clearly there, is, there are important efforts toward training science communication, but still insufficient. Uh, it's important to say that Latin America is a huge uh, part of the world actually um, is, um, accounts for nearly 13, 1-3% of the, the whole land surface. And uh, we see a great uh, cultural, cultural diversity. So uh, for giving you uh, an idea, only Brazil, we identified 1,300 uh, master and doctorate dissertations in science communication. And, and as you can imagine, most of them are actually uh, done in a carry out in, a, in programs that are not, uh, they don't have a supervisor in science communication. They don't have uh, disciplines in science communication. And particularly now with, in this context of uh, fake news of COVID, you know that Brazil is a mess now in terms of everything, including uh, uh, communication and uh, information. So we really need more opportunities for teaching science communication. And, uh, and also we, uh, we do have many doubts and challenges in how to teach science communication, how to do science communication. So we really look forward more opportunities for sharing experience. So I hope that we can keep this dialogue uh, uh, on and uh, keep talking and sharing experience. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Louisa. And bang on time, look at that, well done. Okay, that's fantastic. A lot of issues there, and um, I'm seeing a lot of questions come up with the, in the chat, so, so keep those coming. So um, after our next speaker, uh, we will have plenty of time to kind of go through those questions and have a bit more discussion. Um, so our final speaker uh, this evening is Dr. Marina Joubert, who um, helped uh, plan and organize uh, the session this evening. Uh, so five years ago, uh, Marina was instrumental in uh, starting the first master's program in science communication uh, in South Africa um, with a focus on science engagement. Um, and this program still is uh, the only one <laughs> uh, in, in Africa at Stellenbosch University. So Marina, do you want to talk a little bit about how you set up a program and what kind of inputs you need to make a successful program? Thank you very, very much, Joan, and everybody who joined us today. It's really fantastic to, um, to participate today. And uh, so I think the, the speakers that spoke before me today have a much longer and much richer experience of science communication teaching than what I have. But in a way, that is exactly why I'm here today. I'm kind of a voice for people who are new to the field, who are starting up academic programs for the first time. And it's not always um, very easy. And, and that's why I think, you know, 
such a network it could also be a great idea as mentioned before now we all know that science communication is closely connected to context and culture and therefore you cannot simply copy curricula or materials between countries and that's not what i'm proposing at all i want to make that very clear but it is about sharing not only um, learning from people who've done it before, but also giving back as you gain experience from especially developing country contexts. So it's always a two way street for me, you know, this kind of networking. Now, today, at, you know, at this stage of my career, I can call myself a science communication teacher and lecturer, but it wasn't that easy to get to this point. And, and if I think back just very briefly, in 1996, now that's almost a quarter of a century ago, I attended the very first international PCST network conference, the, the PCST network that I'm sure you all uh, know by now. And this was in Melbourne, Australia, and it was a turning point for me in my career. It was the first time that I met people who made a living and a career, not only out of science communication practice, but also teaching and research. And that conference in Melbourne really inspired me. Um, two years later in 1998 in Berlin, um, I was you know, working with my colleagues in South Africa and we submitted a, a bid to host a conference in, in Cape Town in South Africa. And in 2002, we actually hosted the first um, PCST network conference in South Africa. And that conference, again, was a huge injection of interest and, exp and experience in the field and the start of lots of networks between people that we still, for many, many years afterwards, I would even say, even still today, we come across people who started collaborating and who, who started doing things together because of that conference in 2002 in South Africa. Also at the time, of course, from about 1994 onwards, things were changing politically in South Africa. It was the end of the so-called apartheid era and the new democratic government was keen for all South Africans to engage with science. So the time was right and science communication practice really took off in the country. But it, take a, it took much, much longer for us to get a critical mass of research going in the country and especially to get an academic program going. And I can remember many occasions where we spoke to young scientists about how important science communication is and how to integrate it into their careers. And then they would come to me afterwards and ask me, you know, where can I find out more? Is there somewhere where I can study this field? Is there somewhere where I can get involved in research? And for many, many years, I had to tell them that unfortunately, we did not have any such option it was in South Africa. A handful of people who could afford it did go to the UK or the US or Australia or somewhere else in the world to go and study science communication. But for most, you know, the door was closed. And there, therefore, it was, of course, fantastic for us when at last in 2014, our Minister of Science at the time, Naledi Pandor, announced that she, she would start a science communication chair in South Africa. And it was a process and eventually the chair was established at Stellenbosch University. And now we also have a chair in public understanding of biotechnology at Rhodes University. It's not exactly the same, but it's sort of connected and we do collaborate. And now for the first time, you know, I have a group of colleagues that I work together with, we can officially represent South Africa as science communication researchers. But to the best of my knowledge, there's not yet any similar academic program specifically in science communication anywhere else on the African continent. So you can imagine that um, it is very different to work like that uh, compared to a country where there are postgraduate programs dotted all over the map and sometimes even many programs within the same city. And when I had to start off this program, I really um, probably made a nuisance of myself, but I banked on the generosity of so many people around the world that really helped me with ideas for the curriculum, how to set it up, um, what kind of exercises you could do with students, how you could make sure that there's a link between the practice and the research. It's very, very dangerous to mention names, but I thought today, because it is about networking and the value of input, I just wanted to say and, and maybe even use this opportunity to thank people like Jenny Metcalf, Michelle Riedlinger and Toss Gaskett in Australia who made such a big difference in my career and also the development of our course over the time. I was also helped a lot by Nancy Longnecker who now teaches in New Zealand and on the other side of the world I think um, Bruce you, is on the call today and people like Sharon Dunwoody, Bruce Lewinstein and scholars in Europe like Hans Peter Peters, Brian Trench and Massimiano Buchi. I'm mentioning these names because these people gave me the confidence to know that what we are putting together in South Africa is on par 
with what is done in the rest of the world. And that is extremely important when you start a new program. Of course, then you take what people share with you and you adapt it to your local context and your local challenges. And so I think over time, science communication teachers and researchers in the South and in developing countries will also increasingly be able to add value to other programs in the North and in developed countries, especially because we really have, in, I would say, intensive experience of advancing diversity, equality and inclusiveness in everything we do. And of course, as was also mentioned today, science communication is such a dynamic field. Who could have foreseen what 2020 would bring? Who would think that you know, science communication would suddenly be such a hot topic? And we have to respond to those challenges. We have to bring it into our teaching. And it would be so amazing if we could share ideas on that topic as well. And that's why I think such a network could be hugely helpful and will also lead to future collaborations between the North and the South, and also South-South research collaborations, which, which we really need. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. That's wonderful. Thank you. And so um, I, I don't know um, if everyone has their reactions here, but I'm going to give a virtual hand clap to all five um, of our speakers um, who uh, did a great job, but also kept to time. So thank you uh, very much for that. Um, there are a lot of questions here, and I am kind of going through those. To kick us off, though, um, one of the questions has kind of come up a few times and it differs from program to program and how you imagine teaching and that is kind of who are the audiences for these uh for, for programs that we have um and also if we were to form some sort of network um you know how would we focus our energies on um on these various audiences uh so i don't know who wants to tackle that first uh, Franz, you had a little bit of data on that, and Louisa, you also um, uh, addressed this issue too. So, do we want to start with um, with Franz? Do you want to you want to tackle this about who the audiences are that we we might consider? What is the exact question? Um, so, so you know, um, some of the people have mentioned that the audiences for science communication programs are the training of scientists, research scientists. Others have said no, more interested in training. Um, oh, yeah. science communicators and then Louisa had an amazing list um, of you know, curators and designers and other other professionals so I just I wondered if you had a sense from the work that you did your um, yeah, in, in the Netherlands let's add, I speak on behalf of Utrecht University in which is in the center of the Netherlands but it's also uh, for the other universities we have a right wide, wide range of audiences as I said it used to be public at large uh, in the past right now it could be for uh, for patient groups uh, that we address things or do things with students for patient groups. It could be for still for the audience at large visiting science centers or visiting zoos, for instance. Uh, but, but we could also uh, organize interventions uh, aimed at specific uh, groups of stakeholders, so not the public at large, for instance. Mm -hmm. So so. And anyone who is not in a scientific discipline and who might have an interest in that discipline and likes to uh, have a relation uh, with the discipline is an audience. Mm -hmm. Louisa, do you want to jump in here and, and, and talk about what's going on in, in, in the program? Do you know? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very diverse uh, audience. Uh, in, in some cases, it's more like scientists, but still scientists from different uh, backgrounds and different uh, steps of uh, their careers. But in, in most of the, at least in some of the other programs, it's a very diverse uh, group. In our case, it's usually it's like one third people working in museums with totally different backgrounds, then one third of journalists and one third of everybody. <laughs> can be people from uh, artists, uh, uh, design, and uh, so it's a very diverse uh, uh, field here in Latin America. Great. Elizabeth, did you want to jump in here as well? About who the, who the uh, students are? <clears throat> Right, so, so it, it very much depends on whether you're talking about training programs. So that's often practicing scientists, maybe PhD students, researchers. So the training programs tend to be science communication training for researchers, as I see. If you're talking about formal educational programs, it, it, I think you have to decide that when you're setting up your program. You know, is this to train people to follow a research career or is it so that they can go into science communication practice? And I would say just looking around, particularly in the UK and a few other programs, it seems that the 
the majority of masters are training students to go into science communication practice. Um, so I, I don't know if that helps answer the question. But somebody mentioned on the, the, the um, chat there about undergraduate. I mean, in the University of Edinburgh, <clears throat> and we did this kind of survey around the UK, many, many universities offer undergraduate teaching, not just training, but teaching in science communication as well. And that's generally for scientists. So scientists might be studying chemistry and they do a 10 or 20 credit course in science communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really useful. I, a trend that we're starting to see as well is not just training um, future science communicators, although we've kind of trained a generation of those in our program. Um, but what I'm seeing now is that people from other professions coming in, seeing science communication as an inter, a kind of interdisciplinary mix that can then mix with work in science policy, for example. Uh, yeah. and, and that's, so that, that's a really good point. Yeah, we see a lot of that in our online program, particularly. Yeah. 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 yeah so that's an interesting development. Um, so I think that's that's a really interesting set of questions. Did anybody else want to jump in there on on um, directing their programs to particular audiences of students? Perhaps if if I may add, I think I mistook your your question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> of course, we have audiences on different levels. Uh, uh, the, the the students that we teach are usually as natural uh, natural scientists, uh, who could then become a science journalist. Uh, and some, some are going to work for uh, science museums, for instance, uh, and, and others just use it for, uh, uh, for, their, for their practice in, uh, in science itself. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole range of uh, uh, audiences within university. Yep, okay. Um, there, there's a sort of an, another um, interesting uh, subtext kind of going on uh, in the questions uh, or in the comments as well. And that's, um, I, and Elizabeth, you kind of suggested this in, in, in your talk. Um, so there, there are all these pressures, these drivers, and some of these are business models, and um, you know, some of these are national regulation structures about what kinds of students and how we advertise for them and, and how we compete with each other globally, you know, in terms of the pricing of courses and all those very interesting issues. Um, and, and, and you were, but you were talking about quality standards. And that, that's another area where um, I, I think there's going to be rich discussion about quality standards in science communication, what the baselines are, what the benchmarks might be, um, and then what other things we consider necessary to the teaching of postgraduate science communication, you know, ethics, for example, or something like that. Do you, do you have any comments you'd like to make about that? Just on mute, sorry, missed the button there. Um, I think there's two there's almost two questions there. There's quality standards in science communication itself. What does quality science communication look like and how do we ensure quality science communication? Because we have a responsibility towards our audiences and that's where the ethics aspect actually comes in. But there's also quality standards in teaching of science communication and I quite like to make that differentiation between the practice and the teaching and that's why I was hinting at perhaps we could there's one uh, one role for the network could be in that external examiner system for quality and teaching but I think these are two separate things quality of science communication and then quality of teaching and science communication yeah I, I guess I'm more interested and big questions yeah, yes yeah, big questions aren't they? they they are does anybody else want to um kind of jump in here I mean the the UK has an external examiner system uh, Australia has a very elaborate review system where we all run around reviewing each other's programs. Uh, so so um, does anybody else want to kind of um, come in here on other issues in, in terms of quality control? Can I, um, I mean, because I think this goes back to both the question of who we're teaching, but also the kind of institutional context that we're teaching in. So for example, um, in my institution, we teach scientists in amongst people who, who want to have qualifications in science communication. They sit in a classroom together and do the same thing at an undergraduate level. At a postgraduate level, we would be expecting a different quality of work from a student in the engineering department than within our own. And I think one of the things I've noticed, so I'm an external examiner in another 
um, science communication program in the UK and I think one of the differences that I notice is the institutional context so I'm in a science and technology studies department which is a critical department and we take a critical stance to technology our jobs are certainly not to say yay isn't science exciting come and look at this new shiny gadget and the, the content and the style of communication is very different that students learn as a result of that and I think to come you know from another institution say you're doing it all wrong because you're not teaching them how to sell stuff for Microsoft you know it, yeah it's kind of it's interesting issue mm -hmm. that's great Franz did you want to jump in here yeah I would I'd like to make a case for the following I think it's not not just about the quality control of the thing what you are teaching uh, for, for instance will your students become better writers in, in popular science for instance but I think it's more important is also, are you teaching the, the right things? Uh, are you teaching, uh, uh, will they become uh, 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 professionals who are able to really engage stakeholders, for instance? Or will they only become professionals who just tell uh, what their science is about? I think it should be the, uh, the first option, for instance. So it's not about doing the things right. It's also, it's, ma it's mainly about doing the right things. And I'm not sure how to test the quality of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have, have an answer to that. So it's more complex than yeah. uh, I would say. Okay. So you're not proposing a canon of science communication then? <laughs> you're proposing what? A teaching canon of science communication. That would be an interesting uh, project. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another set of, um, of uh, comments really interesting going on in the chat, and that is about the internationalization um, of programs, which means that many of the students um, uh, are coming to other cultures to study. Uh, I, I can imagine that's an issue just about everywhere. It certainly here is, is here in Australia, and I know it is in the UK as well. Um, and so how do you handle that? We, for example, have a program, a uh, really great program with the National University of Singapore. And so trying to handle case studies across the Asia Pacific and, um, and into Australia so that students have a, a really rich mix of things. Um, to talk about, um, but and 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 then we also um, have a course on intercultural science communication, which is um, which is a, a really interesting area. Does anyone else have any interesting uh, or novel ways of working that intercultural those questions in science communication? Melanie, what do you guys do? Well, I was just thinking what I can say constructively because I think. Um, it sometimes feels like a shock that we're in that environment. So at UCL, we have an incredibly international um, intake. And, you know, I, th I think that the standard European examples and case studies just don't do the job anymore. So we try to supplement, um, or not just supplement, but we try to really have international global perspectives in the material. But the new programme that we're developing certainly is going to have an entirely global focus and recognising that media travels, that, you know, teaching people how to get published in the Guardian and Times is not going to serve them well in the 21st century as careers. So, you know, really thinking about um, what it means to be a science communicator in a global context. And for us, the biggest issue is language. So, you know what do we do about non-native speakers how do we how you know how do you grade communication work that you that is not well is not in good english is is that a problem should we be worried about it that's a constant discussion that we have mm. so marina do you want to jump in here because you, you know in your in your five minutes you kind of provoked us a little bit to talking about how the science communication uh program kind of came out of you know the apartheid area and was related. I mean, how, how are you handling those intercultural issues? Yes, I would say, you know, post the apartheid era, there was a new window of opportunity to really get it established and with, with support from, from the government, because political support in the end is really important because obviously then it comes with funding. What I do experience in South Africa is some tension between internationalization, um, you know, having an international flavor, having international partners, but also the pushback against the idea of colonial approaches, you know, to decolonialize the, the, the teaching materials and, and not to appear to even come always with, you know, even in, in the reading material 
materials, in the case studies, in the voices that we make heard in our materials, we must be very sensitive to including diversity of voices, voices from the developing world and voices from the African continent. So that is a very, very important balance that you have to be aware of all the time. Also a gender balance, but definitely also a cultural and diversity balance. And then even in South Africa, there's a big push to, to be more diverse in terms of the languages that we accommodate and that we develop in terms of science communication. We now have young science communicators in the country that are doing exciting work in Isi Zulu and Isi Koza and, and even inventing new vocabularies and etc. So there is definitely, you know, very exciting and interesting um, time uh, field as well. But, but certainly we don't want to be working in isolation. We don't want to be on our own, but we also don't want to be seen to be Eurocentric or, you know, forgetting about our local context. I think that's a balance that we must be striving for all the time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marina, does anybody else want to add in here uh, about th that, that intercultural uh, mix of um, students and, and seeing, um, you know, science communication as a globalized <laughs> uh, phenomenon? Melanie mentioned media um, and, of course, um, you know, scientists themselves travel. <laughs> and so it's no surprise that science communication travels, um, you know, uh, enormously. Does anybody else want to jump in here? Louisa, Louisa, Joe. I'm sorry, I just can't see. Uh, sorry, Louisa, Louisa. I didn't mean yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just that obviously internationalization is extremely important, especially in science communication. But uh, I think that in terms of Latin American and specifically in terms of our master, it's very important to think about the, the national context because we, we have uh, little access to literature uh, related to science communication and even less in terms of uh, science communication research. And, uh, and we know very little about the long, very long history of science communication that we do have in Latin America and specifically in Brazil. So in our master, for example, the, the very first uh, uh, course that we have, module that we have, is actually introduction of science communication in which the history of science communication in Brazil has a very strong component because we believe that, yes, it's important to understand uh, science communication in the world, but also to understand what is going on in Brazil in the past and in the present and thinking about the future. Yeah, that's interesting, that kind of deep historical groundedness to how you how you go about it. That's that's really interesting. So we started uh, talking, uh, we started the questions with audiences um, and perhaps we'll kind of um, go to another big communication topic and that's, you know, the purposes of, um, of science communication and that's kind of been suggested uh, here as well. Um, Melanie, you were saying, uh, you know, she, you come from a critical tradition uh, and so science communication, uh, your programs aren't trying to, to train people to go out and say, go science, uh, rather to do other things. Do you want to talk a little bit about what those other purposes might be? And then we can kind of just, you know, lay out a bit of a landscape about a range of purposes in science communication programs. Yeah, I mean, I think that we just take a more roundabout route to getting to the same place in some in some ways. So I think um, the I, I, th I think sort of the, the idea that we have is that it, it's not credible anymore to say to people this narrative that science is going to solve all of our problems. Um, and science communicators who stick to that, you know, aren't going to do the job for the people paying them. So we're trying to help the future science communicators to think through why there may be resistances, how benefits pattern across populations and, and countries, and how you would reflect that in how you communicate. It might end up in some instances that you do carry on saying this is exciting. But, you know, our view is that even companies like Google and Facebook have to acknowledge some of the downsides of what they're doing if they're going to be dealt with seriously especially that's, yeah yeah and that's really interesting one of the things we're seeing also in our programs is um it's not just scientists coming in to do postgraduate degrees in science communication um it's advocates yeah. <laughs> and and they have very distinct purposes that are not necessarily the promotion of a particular scientific point of view but rather maybe an advocacy position whether that's um, about environmental communication or whether that's about you know, oceans or whether it's about anti-GM. I mean, the, you know, it's a wide swath of advocacy positions that, that this new group of people come in with. Um, 
want to get some of the other panelists here to talk a little bit about you know, the purposes of science communication as it's kind of embedded in their programs. Franz, you mentioned journalism before, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, yes, every, every now and then uh, our students become journalists also for the, for the, for the bigger newspapers. Uh, but, but most of the time they, they, they tend to work for the, for the, 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 the public websites, uh, uh, websites such as Scientias.nl or Kennisling.nl, which are the major websites in the Netherlands where you find, find popular science articles, for instance. Um, but, but yeah, yes, um, uh, as the previous speaker said, uh, the, the, uh, the, the goals uh, of science communication have changed because it, they no longer uh, uh, tell you about uh, the, the latest scientific findings, but uh, how to deal with uncertainty in science, for instance, uh, um, and how to engage stakeholders so that they have real input in, in uh, scientific agendas, for instance. These could be the purposes uh, uh, inside courses or, or, or for the future science communicators. And these are way more relevant than just the purpose of uh, telling the story. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Thinking about move that moving from the engagement paradigm to a co-design paradigm and how that starts to look very different. Um, yeah, no, really interesting. Uh, Louisa, do you want to jump in here about a little bit about this, this purposes question? Um, and thinking also about, you know, the Red Pop Network, um, which, you know, or Side DevNet, which has a, a kind of advocacy angle as well. Yeah, I thought uh, Red Pop and uh... And uh, SciDev is very practical science journalism, right? So it's really like, uh, and uh, in terms of SciDev, uh, it's an uh, important uh, focus is trying to do the link between science and development in the developing world. And I think that's very important, again, because uh, usually people know much more about science in Europe or United States and not uh, in Latin America. So SciDev in Latin America, we have a strong, um, like uh, advocacy, but also a window for for uh, having more contact to know more about science in Latin America. In terms of Red Pop, it's more, it, it started as a, a network much more about uh, people who uh, do practical uh, activities in science communication, and it was especially in science museums. And uh, now in the, the last years, we, uh, we are doing more research in science communication. So, and, but also I think that uh, uh, one important aspect of science communication is that the pra practice and uh, research in science communication, they talk a lot. So even in our master, uh, we are not uh, giving skills for science communicators to do science communication, but we hope that we are uh, giving them some thoughts, some thinking about uh, what means science communication for society, and then they can do uh, better their work as science communicator. That is, not nobody who uh, follow our master, they want to do research in science communication, but those uh, who want to be practical science communicators, we hope that is also useful for them. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, M Marina, do you want to jump in here as well? I mean, I mean you have the, the, the sole program there <laughs> uh, in South Africa. Yeah. I mean, so how do you see your purpose there? Maybe I should quickly explain that our program is housed within a broader framework of science and technology studies. And this is exactly why we also see, um, I personally, see some tension sometimes um, and a little bit of a disconnect that maybe other people can also comment on. And this is that young scientists often come to our programs with kind of stars in their eyes, expecting to, 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 to learn how to communicate science and, and kind of wanting to change the world. And then some of the modules, you know, the approach within our broader program is, is quite critical and reflective um, sociology of science, philosophy of science, you know, getting away from the idea of promoting science, but rather being critical, reflective about the relationship between science and society. And it's quite different sometimes from what the students maybe expected or hoped, you know, when they enrolled for the program. So I'm finding that balance between also practical skills, you know, allowing people to walk away, being able to produce a wildlife documentary versus training them to be, you know, in social science methodology, for example, you know, so there's, there's a lot of, and this is why the point I should maybe have made at the start was, I kind of feel when you teach physics or chemistry anywhere in the world, there's core things that's going to be the same. It doesn't matter where you are, but science communication is so different, but still, I do think that 
whether it's a research focus program or a practice focus program or maybe both what i think could be incredibly valuable for a network like ours is to come up with a almost like a core set of cornerstone topics like ethics or whatever it may be i don't want to go into too much detail now if we could jointly you know develop something like that like if you because time is all we all know that as teachers you always have limited time to engage with the students and it's always a problem but if you could say like if you if you have these seven topics then you are you know you set the foundations and then you build on that you know in terms of your own objectives and your own context and cultures but it's it's um it's definitely i think in our case sometimes a challenge um what is actually delivered versus what the students may be expecting when they enroll even for a master's program or a phd yeah we could talk about that for um a long time and of course we were hoping to be able to all sit together um in beautiful aberdeen and um hatch out a plan and um have a have a much longer conversation but this conversation has flushed out a lot of topics that are obviously of mutual interest and so now is the time in our program where i ask the group um, and this is where you need your little yes button here um, to ask the group to indicate how many people uh, on the webinar tonight are keen to keep this discussion going to see if we can get a network off the ground um, to have more of these conversations uh, more webinars etc so i'm going to give you a minute um, I, won't, a yes button. I won't hum, but um, I'll give you a minute to put uh, a yes or just think about it. Or if you want to lurk, that's fine too. But just, to, just so we can get an idea of, of the level of interest. Okay, super. That's great. Okay. I'm now, saying yes as well. Um, <laughs> I can't <laughs> find the yes button. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, thumbs up will work as well. That's great. All right, so um, so obviously um, this is an idea with some legs, which is fantastic. Now this uh, webinar, we're coming to the end of um, our hour and we're going into the wee hour. Well, not, not in the morning yet, but we're very late at night here uh, in Australia. I know some people are just starting the day, but we're just ending it here. Um, so we've recorded the webinar and it will be available uh, to you through a link um, after uh, we're done tonight. Um, and um, the chat will also be saved um, because I, I have been going through here as fast as I can and um, there is an incredible chat going on here that we, I would like to spend a little bit more time on. There's resources here, there's more questions, um, great comments, um, fabulous reflections uh, from, from people. So we need to keep that. So that chat's gonna be kept and that will also be available to you. Um, also look out for an evaluation that will be coming uh, to you uh, shortly, and that'll ask you about other things you might like to talk about, um, both other subjects, um, other topics, but also how we might go forward um, in relation to the network. So look out for that. Um, I really want to thank Jenny Metcalf for hosting uh, our webinar tonight. And please, can we give a round of applause, a round of virtual applause uh, for our panelists who, um, who presented uh, in a very quick time this evening. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all, if not in beautiful Aberdeen, somewhere else soon. So thank you, everyone, and thanks, thank you very much to the audience.